Welcome to The Profile, I'm Gary Dunn, and in the hot seat tonight is one of my favourite persons of all time, Mr Johnny Young. Oh, you, Gary, what have you done? <laughs> You've got me here. To, is this like 60 minutes? Do I have to expose all my deep, dark secrets? Not at all, secrets. Johnny. I'm not going to make it. Because I don't have any. You know, don't? What you see is what you get. Johnny, no. I wanted to ask you, where were you born? I was born in uh, Rotterdam, Holland. My oh. parents were Dutch, came here when I was just born. Yep. Uh, and um, I've, I've been a West Australian boy all my life. I was raised in Subiaco, uh, went to Perth Modern School, yep. Subi State School, the best state school in the whole <laughs> wide world. It was fantastic. Got up to a lot of mischief, but had a reasonable education. Yep. And uh, then when I was 14, the whole crazy show business world opened up to me. So, yep. you know, I, I look, Brian Cadd said to me, the most beautiful expression, and I think it's so true. Those of us who were teenagers in the 60s were the luckiest kids on the block. Yes. And I really feel that. You wow. know, I was a teenager in the 60s and the world was my oyster. Wow. And Elvis was on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> so what instruments do you play? Um, I, I learned to play guitar when I was uh, about eight. Yep. A uh, cousin of mine had a guitar, he throwed, showed me three chords, uh, D, G and A. Yep. And um, I, I could sing every song to those three chords. <laughs> it was a wonderful experience having an instrument yeah. to, to, to sing with, unprofessionally, but I just, I always sang. And mum encouraged me too, you know, she was, she was, she had one of those great radios, you remember the, our viewers will remember the radios in the in the 40s and 50s that had sort of like a wooden, was shaped like yes. an M and had a fantastic speaker. Mm. And uh, mum used to play the, you know, the songs of the time, um, Oh My Papa by Eddie Fisher, I remember, Oh My Papa. So she was a singer? She sang in a choir, but it was interesting, you see, in those days, she told me that, um, her um, her parents were to the extreme right and my mother wanted to sing with the only choir in town, which was the communist choir. <laughs> and so Joel. my parents wouldn't allow her yeah. to sing with that choir because it was because they were extreme, you know, mm. right Christian yeah. people yeah. with the Bible and the belt next to it. Yeah. You know, it was pretty full on. Mm. Uh, so um, mum told me she used to stand outside the hall and sing along with the choir yeah. and loved it. So of course she was very happy when I took an interest mm. in music, but I think I got it from her love of it. Yeah. Because she, you know, it was just after the war, she had a terrible time during the war uh, under the Germans and, you know, all the, the stuff that went on. And uh, her, she kept herself sane by listening to music. Mm. And, uh, you know, dad had gone away to the war, so, you know, times were tough. Sure. And again, my mother escaped in music. So for me, you know, I learned very young yes. that there is an escape in music. Yes. You know, yes. there's a place you can find uh, that, that can really help you in dark times. And as a musician, I know exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's there. wonderful. So what was the, can you remember the moment in your life where you decided this is what you were going to do? Look, I had no say in it mm. uh, because in, everybody in my family was a bit dark because I was the youngest in the family and the rest of the family had gone through World War II and all mm. that that brought. And so there was, you know, quite a bit. Dad had been taken away by the Germans to work in, in arms factories and stuff because he was a brilliant welder. And so they had a rough time. Sure. Uh, my grandmother got bombed out, you know, and, and mum was a very nervy person. So the war was horrible wow. for her. So it was a lot of darkness. And uh, and I learned from her that music can lift you up. Mm. So music was my escape. Yes. Yeah. I did my first professional job. I'm going to look straight in the camera. I really want you to believe me. I did my first paid job as an entertainer when I was two. Whoa. Let me tell you the story behind Please. it. Please. The next door neighbor had chooks. And I was always walking around, you know, singing songs. And the next door neighbor said to me, Sing me a song, I'll give you a chook. <laughs> so I, I, I sang him a song. Um, I, I can't remember the title, but it was, Hey, Barbariba, hey, Barbariba, da, 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 da. That was, that was an easy song to sing for yes. a two-year-old, you know. Hey, Barbariba was about yes. the sum title of the lyric. Yeah. And uh, so I sang the song and he gave me a chook. Wow. 
Wow. And I, I came home and, uh, uh, you know, I watched as, well, Dad disappeared and the chook lost its head and then it, <laughs> it came back. <laughs> Mum plucked it. And on the Sunday <laughs> afternoon, the Sunday lunchtime, uh, we had the chook in a big pot with veggies. Wow. And my dad, bless his soul, uh, was so proud of me. And he told the whole family, he said, you know, Johnny has really contributed. To, this mm. was his first contribution to wow. our family. At two years old. And as two years old. And I was so happy because they were happy because they weren't often happy, mm. you know. So yes. seeing them happy caused by me was a big deal for yeah, me. Yeah, absolutely. And so from then on in, I always participated. I, I, I sold newspapers when I was six yep. on the corner of Beaufort Street outside the pub. Daily newspaper, paper, <laughs> outside the Regal Theatre. Yeah. <coughs> Same thing. I had a paper round. And uh, I started when I was six and, and kept working from when I was six. Wow. By the time I left school at 14 and started a career, uh, I'd already wor worked since I was two. So from the age of 14... <laughs> It's yeah. a true story, yes. man. And from the age of 14, you were a lead vocalist in the Nomads, later known as The Strangers. Well, again, there's a wonderful story there, Please, you know, because I, I, was, I always loved music. And on Saturday afternoons from when I was about 11, uh, I used to go to the Embassy Ballroom for the Hi-Fi Club mm. dance run by Colin Nicol <clears throat> for 6KY, yep. the radio station. And I used to go on Saturday morning... Uh, to sing at Rumpus Room with Uncle Lionel, who did breakfast on 6KY, and Uncle Lionel ran uh, Rumpus Room. Talking about Lionel York. No, Lionel Lewis. Oh, sorry, Lionel, Lionel Lewis. Lionel Lewis, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, long before Lionel yeah. York, he's a mate of mine too, but, <laughs> yeah. no, uh, but Lionel Lewis was exceptional and a very, very funny man who did a very funny breakfast show. And then on Saturday mornings at 11 o'clock, he did this show called Rumpus Room. Yep. And they, they had a studio and all the kids would go in there and uh, Auntie Freddie was on the piano. Uh, it was a little blonde uh, piano in the corner. Not Auntie Freddie Mercury. Auntie Freddie, no, Auntie Freddie used to sit there and play, play the piano and, and we'd all sing along with her. So, uh, uh, you know, the show would start and, and Lionel Lewis said, oh, welcome to Rumpus Room. We are the kids of Rumpus Room. Hear us sing and hear us boom. Uncle Lionel's in good voice. Auntie Freddie plays our choice. Gibson sweets and cotties galore. Make us yell for more, more, more. Rumpus Room is on its way. Rumpus Room, hip, hip, hooray. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I tell you, it was fantastic. And I was always in the front row. Yeah. And then one... And, and Auntie Freddie on the piano, she was so funny because it was all kids. And she was sitting there with a fan <laughs> in her mouth. <laughs> as you did in those days. As you did in those days during the whole radio show. It was just wonderful. Uh, and she was great because she could play fantastic anything. Fantastic story. So after the, uh, the, the show, uh, one Saturday, uh, he, uh, Lionel said to me, uh, Johnny, I see how you really want to sing. Come next week, dress up a little bit, and I'll let you sing a song on your own. Whoa. So mum, I don't know whether she made it or bought it and altered it, but she made me a white jacket with sp sparkles on it, you know, little diamantes and everything. And so there I was uh, the following Saturday, in my, you've got to imagine this, in my shorts with <laughs> sandals and this beautiful little white jacket. And, um, and Lionel said, and here he is for the first time ever, a young Johnny Young who could be a star one day appear on an interview program like this one and <laughs> what can i say <laughs> anyway uh, so I, I was so excited so i stepped up to the microphone this is what i sang sugar in the morning sugar in the evening sugar at supper time be my little sugar and love me all the time it was fantastic wow. and i got a round of applause and that was it i knew i wanted to be yep. an entertainer and i knew i also had the ability to overcome the nervous factor. Yeah. You know, I was confident in front of them, yeah. in front of anything. I, do, you know, I learned uh, that you win more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I always tried to be friendly and, yeah. and charming. It was part of my image. So really that was the moment. That was the moment. Yeah. That was the moment, yeah. I think, on, on, uh, on Rumpus Room. Mm. And then my first opportunity 
beyond that to sing for money was on Saturday afternoon at the Embassy Ballroom in town. Um, we had the Saturday afternoon High Fire Club dance. Mm. Bill Blaine and the Dynamics were the resident Bill band. Bill Blaine, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And I was a fan. I used to be right down the front when Peter Anderson came on and sang Elvis. Yeah. You know, he was my idol. Peter Anderson was my idol. And I'd be down there at the front, you know, and I watched his moves. And uh, I bought the black lame jumper with the silver <laughs> sparkles through it and everything. It was fantastic. And I used to go along. And then one day, again, the same thing. The opportunity was presented to me um, when uh, Colin Nicol said, you can come along next Saturday, pick three songs, come to the rehearsal again at 6KY in that same rumpus yep. room yep. studio. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, it was just fantastic because uh, I'm, George Hondras was the guitarist, was the lead guitarist, and Bill and his band, yep. and I sang... Shaken All Over, Hippie Hippie Shake and Blue Suede Shoes, wow. three songs. They were my three songs. And I got to sing on that stage where I'd been watching, wow. um, you know, Peter Anderson. And, you know, five or six hundred kids at the Embassy Ballroom Dance was the biggest in town. Yeah. And I got up there and they liked me. Yeah. They liked me. Wow, you know. And then I got a check. Three pound ten. <laughs> Three pound ten check. Right? It's more than we're getting these days. It was incredible. And um, I took it to my dad and I said, oh, Dad, can you cash this check? It was mm. from the Coca-Cola company. Okay. And Dad said, <laughs> uh, when, when I said, can you cash this check? He said, no, 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 you'll have to leave it with me for a week. It might bounce. <laughs> Coca-Cola. Coca -Cola. <laughs> you know, it would bounce. <laughs> so that was it. Uh, and and uh, from that, there was a band that played at the Fremantle Police Boys Club called um, the uh, Nomads. Yeah. And Don Pryor, John Eddy, uh, Warwick Finlay. Yeah. And, Tony uh, Summers. No, not Tony no, Summers. No, Cole Risby oh, okay. was the first yep. guitarist. And uh, that was the band. And their lead singer was a guy called Jim Muscata. And something happened to Jim. I think he had a car accident or something like that. And he wasn't available for the gig on the Friday night. So I was down, a bit of history here, so I'll, I'll share it with the viewers. Um, the Friday night was the Police Boys Club in Fremantle. Uh, Saturday night was uh, at the, uh, the, the other ballroom in town in James Street, uh, whatever that was called, I can't remember. And then the, the third dance was at the Fiesta Ballroom uh, on Scarborough Beach Road on Wednesday night. So I'm there to see Ray Hoff and the Offbeats on the Wednesday night and, and uh, they go to dance and I ran into Don Pryor, the bass player with the Nomads, who said, we've had an accident with Jim Muscata, can you learn 25 songs by Friday? And so uh, I said, give me the list. Mm -hmm. And I knew every one of the songs on the list. Yeah. So along I went on the Friday and sang my 25 songs and uh, Jimmy never got his job. <laughs> that was it. So that Did he was ever my talk first to you band. After that? Fourteen years <laughs> old. That was my first band. Well. We we changed names. Um, Ray Hoff came over here, pinched a couple of my musos. I hear Ray's name come up. I oh, know he was fantastic. Interest. I could yeah. rave on about yeah. Ray. He had such an influence on all of us here yeah. in WA. Yeah. With the, what the music he introduced us to. Yes. We hadn't heard of Eddie Cochran. We've sort of you know. Hung out with uh, Cliff Richard yes. and the Shadows and yeah. and the uh, Tommy, uh, Tommy Rowe, you know all those uh, uh, short back and side yeah. American stars. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know we, uh, Ray introduced us to the black artists yeah. and uh, and the great music that of course the Beatles were getting off yes. on as well. Yeah. So it was a very important time. Yeah. So you formed Johnny Young and Company. Oh. No. Well, well, it became. So we. We were only the nomads for a short period of time, and then we had some change of of, of membership. Cole Risby went and joined Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs, and uh, I formed another band that was already existing called the Strangers, yes. and uh, it became Johnny and the Strangers. Yeah. And we had some great musos. We we had a fantastic time. We found, um, well, we had John Eddy. Uh, we had Tony Summers on guitar, Graham uh, Nickel on guitar, um, uh, several bass players. Who's that? You, that's a name dropper. Oh, it's a name dropper. 
Yeah, okay. as soon as you drop some good names, I'll ring it. Oh, okay. I can <laughs> drop a few names for you. If oh, you I know you too. can. But that, that, that was the beginning of yeah. it. Very exciting times. And um, we supported the Easy Beats. And well, we, we were successful in a, in a strange sort of a way. We were doing those dances. Um, Fremantle Police Boys Club, Canterbury Court Ballroom, yep. and um, and and some of the other places, but during the week, the universities would have dues. Yeah, called them dues, university dues, mm. and they'd have uh, jazz during the evening because they had bow ties and mm. you know all of that stuff, and uh, they had to behave themselves. And then at eleven o'clock, Johnny and the Strangers <laughs> had come on. And we'd play flat out rock and roll, you know, the Wanderer, all that sort of stuff. Mm. Uh, um, uh, um, yep, like, all, all the, all the uh, Eddie Cochran, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. And they loved it. Oh. They, they loved it. And we, it was very interesting. This is a little bit of inside information. Um, we'd get a fee that would probably give us like five quid each to play for an hour from 11 till midnight. But then we get to midnight and they'd be you know, going through the no, roof. No, wanted to go Because they were all... Busy. So they'd come to, how much to stay a little longer? Oh, look, we don't really have an extra fee, but uh, look, why don't you pass the hat around and uh, then we'll do another hour or whatever you get in the hat. Or we'd get 100, 200 quid <laughs> in, the, in the hat. You know, it was the biggest yeah. uh, con job of all time because they were all half tanked. And uh, they just wanted to party on. Yeah. So they were all throwing 10 quid, for, you know, a lot of mm. money for those days. Wow. So we did really well. And we became the most popular band in Perth, yeah. really. We, you know, we drew a crowd everywhere yeah. we went. Swanbourne Stomp Saturday night was outrageous. Yes. 500 sweaty kids. And they'd have um, the, the iridescent, the blue iridescent light, and you could see the girls' bras through the, <laughs> through the shirts. <laughs> Which was very thrilling for a young <laughs> testosterone-filled <laughs> youngster, you know. <laughs> it was mighty, and they went off. They partied, you yeah. know. They, uh, but it was all clean fun. There was no grog, no yeah. drugs. Maybe a few beers down the back, but it, you know, certainly with us, yeah. we'd have a couple of beers. But no, nobody ever performed drunk on yeah. stage because we were enjoying the music too yes. much. You yeah, know? it was good. So where to from there? Well, then it all started to happen, didn't it? Because my band became really popular, and by the time I was 16, um, we were on Club 17, yep. which was hosted by Gary Carvolf. Yep. <clears throat> and um, again, uh, uh, just an opportunity. Uh, we, we performed a song that we'd recorded at Martin Clark Studios um, because they didn't have really good sound at Channel 7 in yep. those days, so we mimed this record and, and went really well. And they asked me, would I go on jukebox jury which was a segment yep. of the show where you had to judge a record unknowns to me gary carvolth was being promoted up to the uh, tonight show yep. hostings ipt which i always thought was a very unfortunate name ipt oh do you <laughs> see a doctor uh, and you know, <laughs> and it was, you know it was uh, so gary was going to that and they were looking at me on the, on this uh, jukebox jury and how relaxed I was and whatever. So uh, the next week I was hosting the show. Wow. That was it, straight away. So uh, I, and uh, I, again, I was relaxed and it was fun. And uh, yeah, I, I learned a lot because mm. uh, Coralie Condon, who was a lovely Perth icon lady she, Coralie. yeah Coralie was fantastic and and her, her partner lloyd lawson mm. yeah, they used to do that stuff another ring of the bell for lloyd no, thank you no, thank you never gonna stop and um they 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 spoke to me about things like not dropping your h's you know finishing your words and finishing finishing your words and it's not what you actually say it's how you feel mm. You know, you've, you've got to, you've got to find a comfortable place inside you because if you're nervous, people will pick it up. It's so intimate, you know. The, yeah. And uh, so if you're if you're not comfortable, it shows up. When I first started doing this, uh, mm. the first time I'd ever been in front of the camera, so yeah, it was difficult. 
to, it is yeah. it is and a lot of people uh, look it's it's the number one fear that people have mm. is the fear of public speaking yes. so you know and i i've been w working on writing a book called overcoming the fear of public speaking mm. Because ultimately, you know, the changes have to happen on the inside, and exactly. and uh, you uh, you know, the, it's a big conversation. Uh, but fortunately, I don't have it. No, you know, I, I'm comfortable yeah. uh, either in front of a microphone or in front of a camera, because I'm comfortable talking to people. You know, yes. you got nothing to hide. But being famous is a is a nonsense. You know, you still go to bed, put your head in your own pillow. You have to love yourself. How many? Well, that's a big subject, yeah. you know. A lot of a lot of entertainers find being on their own really difficult, mm. because the reason why they become entertainment is uh, entertainers is looking for um, acceptance. Mm. I know that's where it was for me. Same. Yeah, yeah, I wanted yeah. to be accepted. Yes. You know? And and applause is a, it says you're accepted. Yeah, you're a good yeah. good boy. You know, take a bow. Mm. And if you don't get it, it 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 can hurt. Mm. And I've performed at some places where people have totally ignored me. You know, yeah. they just completely ignore me. You know, Ladies and gentlemen, here he is Johnny Argument. Ah, I start singing all my loving and I always get away with it. You know, they, Beautiful. They recognise that, that, that song. song. That's right. <coughs> and who doesn't? Excuse my so, cough. A no, bit that, of hay for no, you. That, that's fine. So um, where were we? Um, Gary Carvel. Um, Gary Carvel. Well, you, you okay. Got the, so so got there the, I was. I started uh, v becoming a television host. Yeah. And then 6KY offered me a job on the radio. So I was doing radio and doing television and working with my band. Yeah. And uh, um, Club 17 became the most popular. It got 50% mm. of the audience. Channel 9 tried to uh, create a show in opposition to us and they called it Pad 9 <laughs> with uh, a guy called Black, something, something Black who was the host, who was uh, a hippie. And he used to say things like, yeah, cool, daddy-o, and all of that. You know, <laughs> and those days. <laughs> the kids didn't like it at all, no. so they had nobody watching. So we got everybody watching. Yeah. And so all the, all the big stars, Normie Rowe, the Easy Beats, you know, uh, Peter, Paul and Mary, mm. uh, Jack, uh, the, uh, Dave Clark Five. So where you built some Bob relationships? Dylan, they were, they, no, they were all guests on my show, yeah. so I saw them for five minutes. But the Easy Beats also performed. So after the show was over, I went into the dressing room and there was George Young, the, you know, the, mm. probably the most legendary of all the songwriters mm. in Australia. Yeah. And he was writing songs with Stevie Wright, not yes. with George yeah. um, yet, and uh, not with Harry, Harry Vander Vander yet. yet. Uh, it was uh, George Young and, and Stevie Wright that were writing all the Easy Beats songs. Mm. Woman, da, 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 da. oh, she's songs. so fine. Yeah, yeah just brilliant. Yeah, songs. just wonderful commercial songs, yeah. just totally brilliant. And um, so I'm in the dressing room, and there's George, and he's got his guitar. And I said, "Hey, George, have you got a song? <laughs> you, know, you got a song I could record?" Never thinking he'd say yes. I was just trying to pay, get a conversation yeah, yeah. going or whatever. I saw an opportunity. That's what I did. Yeah. I saw an opportunity, so I asked him. And he said, yeah, we, I've been working on this song. You know, he did all of that with yeah. his mouth. He yeah. said, da, 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 step back. <laughs> Fantastic. I said, that's, that's perfect. Uh, he said, Stevie hasn't written the words yet. So come to our hotel in Scarborough, where they were staying, mm -hmm. tomorrow morning and uh, bring a tape recorder and, and I'll get Stevie to write the words. Wow. Now, they had a gig that night mm. and, uh, you know, that I arrived being very ambitious at eight o'clock in the morning <laughs> <laughs> and knocked on the Easy Beats door <laughs> and George, it was George that answered the, 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 the door and I looked yeah. inside and there was all the Easy Beats and half a dozen scantily clad girls, <laughs> and it as looked you like do. They, as you do, it looked like they'd had this incredible party, you know. And they probably did. And they probably did. <laughs> so George said, to "Stevie, oh Stevie, you got to write these words for Johnny, you know." So, and they didn't have en suites or anything. No. It was the communal. Uh, so he just sat there and wrote some words. That... No, he went to the toilet. He went to the. <laughs> he, he wrote the words to my first hit on a toilet. 
and uh, <laughs> shit. Came back, yeah, that's it. Came back in, and um, and recorded uh, the demo, which I still have. Wow! It's on an album. Those um, music nuts who who would like to know these details, if you look under uh, Clarion Collections. Oh, and there is okay. an album, and it has the actual demo because I recorded it on Martin Clark's very fancy tape recorder. So we had a really, and it's you can hear it. It was just George and Stevie. Don't you all now play it? Cool now, step. You know, terrible yeah. sounding yeah. voices, but so exciting. Great song. Well, that's probably because it was they had these scantily clad women and was sat up all night and they couldn't do anything. At the well, moment. you know what? <laughs> they were furious because my song went to number one mm -hmm. and the easy beats had another song called woman which of course they'd written but they'd recorded themselves mm. which got to number three <laughs> and and george <laughs> said to me we were so pissed off because it was our song, song. that yeah, kept yeah, us yeah, out of yeah, number yeah, one yeah. you know it was a uh, wonderful bit of show business but they were great to me uh, they were unreal. fantastic yeah. yes and uh, i've always been very fortunate mm. in that way and i guess that's why i got into songwriting too because I know how important it is mm. to have a good song. You know, you can't fake it with songs. No. Even during that, the, in the 60s there, you won a, a Logie. Yeah. Uh, you tell us about that? Well, 67, I think. I did, I did Club 17 for two and a half years. Mm. And then I, I was taken by my record company, Festival Records, over east, to do promotion for Step Back. So they had me on. Commotion, remember that? Time mm. for Commotion, hosted <laughs> by Ken Sparks. And The Go Show, hosted by Ian Turpey. Yeah, Ian Turpey. And uh, a guy called Dick on the ABC, who had a terrific, yeah, there's yeah. another name, uh, Dick Williams. Yes. Bless his soul. <laughs> ABC man, terrific Yeah, you guy. have the bell. Cause, yeah. You know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so, it, look, it was just absolutely wonderful, the support that yeah. I got. I did all these television shows. And I guess, again, because I was comfortable, because I'd had that experience mm. here on Club 17, you know, a, a lot of the pop stars didn't know their way around mm. television, but I did. I was lucky. I'd, yeah. I'd had an education. And guys like Bruce Wishart, who, who taught me stuff about show business and yeah. being professional. Yeah. So uh, there I was touring around promoting my, my records, and Ian Turpey decided to leave the go show because he was offered a lunchtime show on Channel 7. You just happened to be there. And I just happened to be there. <laughs> and always seeing the opportunity yes. when it presents itself. I'm getting the picture now. Uh, you get the picture? <laughs> yes. So they asked me, would, yeah. I, would I host the go, would I be happy Fantastic. to host the Go Show? So there I was hosting the Go Show. Olivia Newton, yeah. John, you know, all the, all the, all the big stars. <sighs> Johnny Farrah from The Strangers who wrote all those hits. Yep. You know, he was leading... Uh, the band, The Strangers, and they were a wonderful band. Yeah. And there comes the answer to your question half an hour ago yes. about the change of name uh, from The Strangers to the company. We yeah. were The Strangers until we came east. And when I came east, there was already a Strangers yeah. that was The Strangers that were on the go show. Yep. Yeah. So there I was going on the go show, being backed by a band called The Strangers. So I couldn't introduce my band as The, the Strangers. Strangers. So, so that company. changed it to, to company with a K. Thanks for finally asking, uh, yeah. answering that question, That's cool. Johnny. That's great. <laughs> so you wrote some big hits. Um, well, let me tell you how that happened. Okay. Because, um, every, you know, it was England in the 60s. It was Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Mm. It was Cream. It was uh, just an amazing time in London. Yeah. Amazing. Everybody wanted to go to London. Normie went to London. He had a fantastic time. Normie Rowe. Yeah. Normie Rowe. Yeah. yeah. And I, I've, I, yeah, there's another drop of a name. Yeah. And well, I, keep coming. <laughs> I was, the year before last, I was in Liverpool and they have in, in Liverpool, next to the Cavern Club, where the Beatles mm. started, yeah. they have what's called the Gold Wall, yes. which is bricks made out of gold. Yes. And I was standing there looking at it, and right in the middle, Normie Rowe. <laughs> Normie wow. had appeared with Gene Pitney yeah. at, the, uh, at the Cavern Club, 
and uh, on his own and with Gene. Mm. And so there he was, because all the people that had appeared there were on these yes, gold bricks, gold you know bricks, what I mean? Yeah. So Normie had been to London, was all exciting, and I'd done just about all I could do in Australia. I'd had my television shows, yeah. I'd had number one hit records, and the pop bubble didn't last too long in mm. those days. You know, it was yeah. maybe two or three years at the top, and yeah. that, then someone else came along, yeah. and someone else was about to. I didn't know it yet, but in 67, John Farnham came mm. along. So even if I'd still been at the top, I would have been knocked off by Farnham mm. anyway. So. Uh, I decided to go to London. So for the whole of 67, I was in London. You shared a flat with Barry Gibbs. Well, I didn't share a flat with Barry. Barry was already in London because they were friends of mine and, and I'd encouraged the producers of the Go Show to have the Bee Gees. The Bee Gees found it hard mm. to get exposure here Isn't in Australia. Because they it was tough. wrote some unbelievable songs in that Yeah, time. but Spicks and Specs was the first one that got yes. any notice. And because they were often on bandstand, the Go Show people you know, weren't really sure whether they uh, wanted to support, uh, mm. you know, what, what they saw as a Sydney act. Yes. Anyway, I said uh, they had to, you know, they should, because they, they were going to be a really big thing, and I was right. So wow. we had yeah. them on several times, and when they were going back to England, uh, their record went to number one yes. in Australia. They found out while they were on the boat. They were Spicks and Specs. Spicks and yeah. Specs. And so they got to London, and, of course, then they, they wrote, New York mining disaster, and they were off, off and running. Yeah. Then I got to London, and I rang Barry, because uh, um, uh, everybody was going to London, and I was in London. Mm. And he said, "Well, you know, you got somewhere to stay." And he, I, I said, "Yeah, well, I'm looking at a flat today in um, uh, Sloan Square." Mm. And he said, "Ah, oh, rubbish, come and stay at my place." Fantastic. So he had a three-story apartment, and uh, the top story was a single room that he gave to me. And at, there was a double bed, and at the head, head of the bed was a, uh, a speaker, an amplifier speaker with a Union Jack across the front. <laughs> and that room had been used by Pete Townsend of The Who. Whoa. So, and and uh, he'd left his, his speaker. But yeah, better ring that bell. Oh, God, yeah. Pete Townsend. So, you know, he wasn't there in the bed anymore, but, he, you know, he, was, he had lived there, and that was exciting for me. Yes. And uh, Barry was living there with his wife, Maureen, yeah. and they made me very welcome. And, um, and Barry always had a guitar in his hand, and he was always writing beginning songs. I'm sure I heard the beginnings of songs like Words and, yes. you know, uh, Got to Get a Message to You and mm. all that. But, you know, they didn't have titles. Barry was just working on chord mm. structure and stuff. And I, again, seeing the opportunity, um, I... Um, um, asked him questions, you know, and I went, what are the rules? And he said, the, the rule is no rules. And he, he told me to listen to Running Scared by Roy Orbison, All right. which is sort of based on the bolero, that mm. bole bolero mm. uh, rhythm, but it has no middle eight. Mm. It just keeps going and keeps going mm. and keeps growing, right? Mm. So, uh, you know, that, that sunk in. There are no rules. Yes. And that's from that theory came the real thing. Yes. No rules, you know. It, 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 it did have sort of a chorus, but the, the chorus wasn't ooh, ma, 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 mm. was a now, and a now with a, with a guitar lick over the top of it mm. that Molly took and made into brilliant ooh, ma, song. ma, ma, was brilliant. <coughs> Molly was wonderful. So, mm. um, so I learned about Molly. song. Yeah, Molly. <laughs> oh, yeah, got to ring the bell. Molly. <laughs> And Ian Morris. I mean, I saw Ian Morris a little while ago doing Russell the real Morris. thing. I saw Russell Morris doing the real thing and just yeah. awesome. Sensational. Yeah, awesome band. Look, Russell and I had a great time. And um, I wrote The Girl That I Love, which was his second single first. Yep. And then Molly heard The Real Thing. Yep. And uh, then we recorded The Real Thing. And then we recorded the follow-up to The Real Thing, which was The Real Thing Part 3 in yep. Paper Walls. And... Uh, Russell often plays that in his set where he plays the real thing and part three into Paper mm. Walls uh, as one piece. He did it the night I saw him. Ah, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, it's 11 yeah. minutes. It's yeah, a yeah. symphony. Just, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. It's beautiful, yeah, it's isn't brilliant. it? Yeah. yeah. So I've heard him do that. And and um, and we used the girl that I love as a B-side, which mm. became an A-side. So I was off and running as a songwriter. And for the next two years, I had five number one songs. Mm. 
in a row. Oh, thank There's you, Lionel right. Rose. Yeah, that was that a was song. a huge hit. Let so, me thank, thank you, you for <laughs> just being in it. <laughs> he was a lovely fella and a great boxer. Tell me about Ronnie Burns because well, Ronnie wrote... Burns was there because I'd known Ronnie for a long time. He was a mate, you know. We used to, oh yeah, yeah, yeah thank it. you. Yeah, <laughs> that's for Ronnie. <laughs> and uh, it was a fantastic time because um, Ronnie was already quite famous. He'd had a couple mm. of minor hits. Yeah, everybody's gonna pray in the very last day. Um, Cole Man, the Bee Gees had written a couple of songs mm. that he recorded and uh, he came to me and he, he said, you know, will you write me a song after I'd written the stuff for, for Russell? I, uh, I said, of course, what, you know, what do you want to write about? And he said, well, I'd like to make a statement about the Vietnam War, but I don't have any personal experience, you know. Mm. Um, he hadn't been called up and mm. I hadn't been called up either, but Normally my own, Rowe, yeah, that's it. My out. only experience of the Vietnam War was uh, Normie Rowe. Mm. So I wrote the song with, uh, about Normie. Wow. <clears throat> Yesterday we had laughter and songs to sing. Yesterday we had love and to burn when Normie and I used to tour. Mm. We were mates and he oh. was happy. You know, we had a fantastic time. Uh, yet today there's... Uh, um, yet yeah, today... There's a war and there's peace to bring. When will they learn? They're, they're, they're the words. Mm. And and um, because when Normie came back from Vietnam... He was different. He, he? Was, yeah. he was an angry young man, as you would mm. have noticed when he smacked Ron Casey. In the back, <laughs> I tell you. He, he, he lost it. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and Normie's a sweetheart, beautiful yes. man. Yeah. You're out in the world today Smiley, you're all on your own Do anything for you. Yeah. True mateship with yeah. Normie Rowe. Yeah. I've had true mateship with Normie Rowe. Fifty years we've known each other. Wow. And and supported each other, and we still work together. And we love working together. Yeah. You know. And when we've when we've had down times, and we both have had down times. Yeah. Uh, he's been there for me, and I've been there right. for him. You know. So yeah. uh, that Real song mates. was about my mate Normie. Yeah. And I called him Smiley, of course. Wow. So that was that. And then uh, Rusty Wiley, who was hosting mm. uh, Uptight Better Re- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The producer wants oh, the bell. Keep it He's going to keep it. Um, <laughs> Rusty Wiley was hosting uh, Uptight and Happening 70. Yep. And he'd already had a hit with a song called um, Funny Man. Uh, look at there, there he goes, there goes the funny man. Really good mm. song written by the guy who did Ahab the Arab and, uh, and who was that? Ray Stevens. Ray Stevens, that's him. Ray Stevens uh, wrote Funny Man. And so um, Ross came to me and he, he said, you know, write me a song. Mm. I, I'll tell you, it was more embarrassing than that. I went to a meeting to have coffee with Ross Lee Wiley at the production office of uptight and he had a meeting and i got sort of fobbed off oh i've got no time for a coffee now go and write me a song youngie whoa you know, sort of go, go write me a song youngie. and they had <laughs> they had a, a dentist chair uh, in down in the reception so i sat in the dentist chair with a three-string guitar and by the time he came out of his meeting i'd written here comes the star wow just in like 20 minutes. Here's your song. Here's your song, <laughs> shove it. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and it was huge. You know, it was, wow. a, it was a, fantastic. It was a big, big hit. Yep. Yeah. So I'm not sure whether I'm moving too far forward here, but 1990 TV Week, Logie Hall of Fame. Look, yeah. you know, the of all the things that I've, that I've done, and they have all been gifts, you know. I, I've I've had wonderful people support me, and yeah. always. And I've had a couple of wonderful wives who've also been very supportive with me too. And of course, my children, and, and I, you know, we're very close. And yeah. uh, I lost a son a couple of years ago yeah, to sorry, pancreatic cancer, which you know a lot of people will have had that experience, which was 
Just terrible. Rotten, just ho- yes. horrible. But, you know, I had him a good long time and uh, he was fantastic in uh, all aspects of the side of entertainment that I don't know anything about, which is the technical wow. side. He was technically inclined and wound up teaching um, media at RMIT University. Wow. But pancreatic cancer is a nasty piece mm. of work and we lost him in 14 months. Wow. Yeah. Oh. But you know, so, so uh, the, uh, I, uh, the the most wonderful part is that I have two beautiful daughters and nine grandchildren. I was going to ask you, how and many they sing and they dance and they do <laughs> all the things. And of course, you do your own young talent time now with well, with I could the, the whole them. <laughs> you see, my my daughters' husbands are all fit. Yep, unlike their father, <laughs> they are all fit. And uh, Andrew, who's my eldest daughter, Anna's husband, uh, his dad was a member of the Melbourne Football Club premiership sides of 1960, 61, 62. Yep. Right? So that's in the genes. Okay. You know, so my, my gene pool has expanded really How well. How did you They've become got... a Bombers fan then? Well, when I went to Melbourne in 1966, the producer of the Go Show. St Kilda won it that year. I think. That's right. By a point. Yeah, mm. yeah, mm. yeah. Well, he, t- he, the, he picked me up from the airport and took me straight to an Essendon game. Oh, right. That, that game. Daryl Baldock, we tried to kick the shit out of him. <laughs> yeah. So I became an Essendon supporter. And, and, and because in Perth, I was Subiaco man. Yep. I loved Subi. I sold newspapers at Subiaco Oval mm. on Saturday afternoon. And and they were useless then. No, they were good. They they were good. Donny Glass. Yeah, I I caught up with Donny Glass was one of the champions, (laughs) and uh, he was wonderful to us. He used Mm. to teach us boxing at the Subiaco Police Boys Club. Sorry, I'm just trying to express my masculinity to you here. No worries. You don't um, think I'm limp, Johnny, limp wristed, no. 87, you didn't decide you were going to switch to Eagles because of a WA? No, 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 nothing like that. Oh, okay. Look, I had a wonderful, the most successful part of my life was from 1971 to 1989. Wow. There was nearly 20 years of young talent time. Yeah. We worked really hard at it. It was an amazing show. We had fantastic music. You know, we had Ross Burton. And, yeah. and Greg Mills and uh, wonderful people working on it. Mm. We had uh, players like Virgil Donati, one of the greatest drummers in the world, yes. who, who, who played on Young Talent yeah. Time. Uh, Charlie Gould, who was the guitarist on Midnight Bus for Betty McRae, yes. was playing in my band. You know, it was just a wonderful time. And we loved it. And we had great kids, wonderful kids. And look how successful Jamie Redfern. All of it. Well, Jamie had an American trip that was to die for, Mm. and and he had a wonderful time. Uh, Deborah Byrne became Queen of Pop, Mm. and she had a wonderful career. She doesn't. She doesn't want to remember her young talent time career with (laughs) much fondness because everybody else does, and Deb has has the habit of taking the opposite point of view. <laughs> if somebody says white, she'll say black just to be different, you know. Yeah. And But she was fantastic. And Tina Arena, my, yeah. my cameraman here, Strawny. Um, yeah. He's uh, just in love with Tina, aren't you? Yeah. She's fantastic. Yeah. I spoke to her two days ago. I'm going to see her Melbourne uh, show of Evita. What a voice. Uh, with her mum. And what yeah. a voice, huh? Sensational. Oh, but what a mensch. What yes. a woman. What yeah. a fantastic girl tough strong you know mm. uh, takes no prisoners mm. and she sings well it's got to be up there with the amongst the top 10 voices oh, i've heard i, I totally music. agree totally agree do, do are you a father figure to to all of these uh really elder brother still? probably elder brother yeah you may have i'm 72 now but i started young talent time when i was 24 well so these kids were only few years younger than me you mm. know so I was like and I came straight out of the pop scene mm. as a songwriter and a singer so they'd always have me sing you know a little medley of rock and roll songs here and there on Young Talent Time and it was the perfect marriage because mm. uh, you know th- it just made sense to me and I grew up with Rumpus Room and the Mickey Mouse Club mm. and, the, and Young Talent Time was Mickey Mouse Club. And that's what I grew up with, yeah. Young Talent Time. That's it, mm-hmm. yeah. So. But I, lo- I loved it. I loved And it, when, when you think about that closing, All My Loving, mm. and it was, you know, it was a hit for me in 67 mm. uh, without, without Young Talent Time. And then when we were looking for a closing, I was thinking about uh, the, that wonderful closing to the Mickey Mouse Club when 
uh, Jimmy and the kids that sit together in a circle mm. like I did at the yeah. end of Young Talent Time. And they sing, now it's time to say goodbye Bye. to all our family. <laughs> M-I-C, <laughs> see you real soon. K-E-Y, why? Because we like you. M-O-U-S-E. That was wonderful. It was just wonderful. And that was my childhood. You know, that's where that fit with my love of music and what it did for me because that that feeling was what I wanted for Young Talent yes. Time. I guess because of the instability in my own family, I found it in that Young Talent Time mm. environment because, you know, it was... I, as soon as Young Talent Time started, I got married and I had my kids. Mm. So, I to, you know, I went from being a, a, a rock and roll a singer and songwriter who liked a chuff here and there too. <laughs> to, you know, I wouldn't know anything about that. No, no, no you know what I mean. <laughs> you know, the, the, my, our audience is aren't innocent. They, they know of they were. Not. The sixties yep. uh, was wild, and I went straight from the, from that world mm. into the world of young talent time and young people. You know, mm. so I had to straighten up and fly right. Yes, straight up and fly <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 So, okay, where do we go to from here? Well, you, t- you tell yeah, me. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's, a, that's about the story because mm. I did 20 years of Young Talent Time. And then uh, when, when that finished, I went back into radio. I, 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 I have always loved radio. And after Young Talent Time, anything on television was too hard to top. Mm. You know what I mean? It was yeah. so such a success story. Everybody expected me to do something else, but as mm. Daryl Summers discovered too, second time round is not always. No, that's correct. You know, yeah. and and they tried to do Channel Ten, tried to do Young Talent Time again, uh, yeah. uh, and and it didn't quite work because it wasn't yeah. Johnny and the Kids. No, that's right. Yeah. And and that was the special sort of ingredient that yes. we were actually living it and loving it. Yeah. Plus. I had sensational kids, mm. you know. They were, they were very, very mm. talented. All of them in their own way. I just wanted to be one of them. Yeah, one that's day, it. You know? so. Yeah, so so that was it until 1989, and then then back into radio, mm. and that's sort of what I've been doing ever since. You know, just doing my doing my radio. I did 10 years of breakfast on mm. on six. Well, Noel Bell, who's yeah, a that's good friend right. of mine, doesn't she was producing. She's fabulous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and we had fun on the on the radio, and uh, currently I do a radio program in Sydney yep. every night from seven till midnight, and I still get my band together here and there and shake a leg, you know, sing a bit of rock and roll. What sort of songs are they playing on your radio show, or do you do you play? Yeah, sixties and seventies. Yep. Cool. That's it. That's cool. all I play because yep. that's my world, you know. And you've just it's doubled your Beatles, ratings. Beatles, everything, yeah. And uh, the, the the ratings are. Whoosh. That was it. Yeah. Well, the, it went down a little bit the time before, and then. I thought, oh, am I not doing any good? And then all of a sudden it doubled on me. But, you know, you learn that you can't live by ratings. Yeah. You've got to be sincere about what you do. And, and uh, as my dad used to say, job worth doing is worth doing well. Mm. So whatever I do, I try and do my best, mm. you know. So what would your favourite band be of all time? Beatles, always. Beatles, yep. yeah. Favourite yeah. singer? Elvis Presley, have to be. Yeah. And um, if you were stranded on a deserted island... Yeah, and I'd like to be accompanied by Elvis Presley. <laughs> Thank you. If you can only take one album with you, what would that be? Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Okay. And and let me explain that. Mm. I love all kinds of music. Yeah. I love all kinds of conversation. You know, I do listen to the ABC. I think they do wonderful current affairs and stuff. Yep. But when I want to hear my music, mm. I listen to my station, 2CH. We play 60s and 70s. The Beatles, Stones, new, uh, yep. uh, Small Faces, you know, everything. Mm. Uh, and, and, um, and those who were who, baby boomers mm. who grew up with me listened to it. Yeah. So I, I you know, I, I like to think that the people who listen to me are the ones I grew up yeah. with. Is Narelle still helping you on that? Or no, no, just... well, I do that in Sydney, see. Okay. Narelle has uh, started a fantastic new career doing Karen. Uh, the Karen mm. Carpenter music, mm. and she doesn't need Johnny. Mm. She's, uh, <laughs> she's got her own audience that she can satisfy. <laughs> no, it. she's great, Narelle. Yeah. And look, it's been a part of my life. You know, I love giving people opportunities because opportunities were given to me. Yes, yeah, you and understand. I mean, I, I'm you. eternally yeah. grateful to the, to the Bruce Wishart's and... and um, 
the, the, the guy I mentioned before from 6KY, Colin Nichol, mm. you know, he started my career. Mm. He gave me an opportunity yep. to perform. Didn't have to. Had faith in me. Yes. Liked my passion and my enthusiasm, mm. you know. And I, I feel the same. When I see somebody like Narelle who really, really, really wants to do something, mm. I'll try and turn or use every influence I can yeah. to make it happen for right. them because, you know, you if you've got that passion, it's got to be fulfilled. Yes, it? exactly yeah. right. So um, what unfulfilled ambitions do you have? Do you have any? To die in my sleep. <laughs> 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 you know, I don't want to be sitting in the corner dribbling. But I oh. think I have enough passion for life mm. to... Uh, hang in until I'm 80 something Good. and uh, I look this will sound very simple but I do have nine of the most incredible grandchildren and they're all different every one of them is unique in their own way isn't it the most wonderful thing I've got I've it's got four an of them amazing but feeling and uh, look there'll be plenty of people listening who have yeah. that experience and mm. and it's precious to me yeah. so I'm trying to make as much room as I can Good for you. I've already had my eldest daughter here she left two weeks ago yep. with four of her kids and uh, then my other daughter is coming and then my son's children are, are coming at Christmas time fantastic so you know they they love coming to Perth mm. They know how much I love it here and yeah. we've got a nice house and they have a good time. Yeah, beautiful. And, um, and, you know, my joy, I think, is going to be watching their talent. Develop. Yes. You know, that's a, that's a mind-blowing thing. I took them flying the other day, you know, in that thing where they, you know, blow the air and you actually yes. fly. Yeah. Uh, Skydiving place. That, and I'm chicken shit you know you never get me doing any of their stuff and there they were yeah, just going for it oh going for it yeah mm. so i think they've got a they've got a bit of passion yep. and adventure and i just want to watch them do their thing right Fantastic. and uh, you know sing a song here and there and have a lovely interview like this one thank you thank, so much thank I've, you i've just totally I'll, enjoyed it thank you it we've wonderful. got a few more questions oh, to go okay. Hello. let's keep you for good to see you again <laughs> so your favorite tv show growing up Mickey Mouse Club. Mickey Mouse Club? I have yeah. to ask these questions. Yeah, no, no, go. Um, Absolutely. Mickey Mouse Club. Definitely. Do you collect anything? <laughs> like little toy soldiers or... or uh, it's a good question. I collect history books. History books, yeah. Yeah, I study history. Yeah. I love reading history. I've just read the most remarkable books on the history of Christianity. Yeah got a very inquisitive mind and I love to read and if I have a hobby away from music mm. it's history yeah wow. in particular Christian history yeah is there a reason for that or just uh, an interest yeah. you know I, I've um, my mother was a Christian who yeah. spent her life in sorrow yes you know and uh, so I uh, there's got to be more to Christianity than we've been told is my is my personal mm. belief system I believe in Christianity I've, I, I believe in God I've had a hand at my back during my entire life you know mm. so I can't deny the presence of yeah. of a greater power but you know I don't want to believe in fairy stories yeah. so I've been studying history to get the real story <laughs> wow. yeah, and those who want to believe Fairy stories, that's okay, but yes. you know, the, uh, I, I like the real thing. Yeah. I'll tell you what I found. You wrote a song about that, I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I found, you'll love this, uh. <laughs> I found this old wooden wheel mm -hmm. that was several hundred years old. It was from a wooden cart, you know, that, uh, that, that somebody would have uh, carted things on mm. a farm but no, no rubber just a wooden wheel just a solid wooden no no spokes or anything like that in it you know no here we go turn it off yeah turn it off. <laughs> just push just johnny's back. phone um narell it's okay he he didn't say too much bad about you <laughs> no, 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 no. um what were we talking it's about about that so, wooden wheel oh yeah the wooden wheel okay so uh, so i had to put in a frame it's in my lounge room wow. and guess what it's called the wheel thing. The wheel thing. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Oh, that's it's ooh, excellent piece of art. Ooh, Wonderful. Would that web it? Would that web it? <laughs> okay, next question. Okay, what would you put on your gravestone? Wow. Okay. 
Um, I don't know whether I'd put it on, but the feeling that I have is I had a wonderful time. Yeah, fantastic. You know, a few few tough things along the way, but, you know, I, no, I, I'm, I'm the luckiest kid in the block. It really, Great I Great thing to put you on. You know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, there you go. Mm. I should put that on my gravestone. I'm the luckiest kid on the block. I'm the luckiest kid in the block, yeah. But I am, you know, I, f I feel from... From nothing, you know, mm. there's a lot of people like me. So I'm not, you know, people say, you're ever going to write a book and stuff. And then I meet these incredible people who aren't perhaps famous, but their story is fabulous. Yes. And I, you know, it would make a wonderful book. Mm. And uh, so, you know, I'm not that into writing a book and I'm definitely not into writing a book that would put shit on anybody yeah. else. Yeah. Uh, I, I, if I write a book and I probably will, it'll be... A celebration, not a uh, not a condemnation. Yes, fantastic. It's not my story, really. Half glass full. Always, yes. always, yeah. absolutely. And and I feel very sad for people who have a miserable time, and a lot of people do. And <sighs> yeah, well, some people can't help it, I suppose, because of the situation. There, absolutely. You, you know, oh like, yeah. Like you were talking about your be parents tough. before being bombed, Germans, and uh, the uh, war. Absolutely, and yeah. Normally, row all that horrible fighting and. Well, you know, it, I mean, the the people that I love, the Vietnam vets, I'm very close to Vietnam mm. vet c community because they actually walk their talk, you know. Mm. Yeah. They 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 went and did it. Mm. Well, Eddie can, Storm we had on recently, he does a lot yeah. for them. He goes and did the Vietnam thing and went and... Yeah. yeah just but, you know, the, the, I mean, th th these guys get damaged permanently. Yeah. Yeah. That's the sad part about it. So it's not just their suffering, yeah. it's their family suffering. And we're hearing more about mental health yeah. all the time and, yes. and depression. And yes. Yeah, it's, uh, well, you know, look, I've known a few people who've done it tough yeah. and who've made mistakes and who've wound up sometimes on the wrong side of yeah. the law. And um, it, I, I, I don't, I'm not an easy forgiver. You know, mm. if you do shit, you can expect shit is my philosophy. Mm. If you do the wrong thing, especially these days, you know, mm. I mean, wouldn't it be, it'd be an incredible story? Yeah, Johnny Young was a secret pedophile. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't the, the media just mm. absolutely love yeah. that, you know? Yeah. And, and, um, and I'm grateful that I don't have those inclinations, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but it's a horror story. That yeah. whole thing is a horror story. Well, there's people coming out left, right, and centre saying it, all, all, sorts all, of stuff. all over the place. But I believe if you did the wrong thing, uh, you just—that's it, it. You deserve it. Oh, absolutely. Because some of these, you know, some of these, and it's not just the churches, but it's everywhere. Mm. Yeah. And you know, I've spoken to some friends of mine, and and. Like them, I had a couple of experiences when I was 12, 13 years old yeah. where I could have wound up in trouble. Yeah. You know, you can't read these mongrels. They're mm. out there in the, in the yeah. community. You can't read them. They find really clever ways of mm. ingratiating themselves mm. with you. And a couple of times I nearly got caught. Mm. Fortunately, I never did get yeah. uh, raped or molested yeah. or anything. Yeah. But uh, certainly... I was a handsome young boy and I felt those pressures, yeah. you know, and, and some of my mates from school and even those things really hard to talk about these days. Absolutely. You know? and, but I'm at, you know, I'm at an age now where I'm happy to talk about that yeah. stuff because it's got to be gone. Yes. You know, Rolf Harris is a bloody disgrace. Mm. And, and what a shame because yes. I was such an admirer of his talent, you know, wonderful talent, but what a scumbag. Yeah. And, um, and a scumbag's a scumbag. You've yeah. got to call yeah. it that, yeah. you know. And if I did the wrong thing, I would expect that to happen. Mm. Um, but fortunately, you know, I, I have a reasonably good reputation mm. beyond the fact that I was a bit of a root rat in my team. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? <laughs> well, well, you know, we all were. I mean, I, 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 oh, there's my bell. <laughs> I'm ringing my hand. Anyway. Yes, yeah, that's okay. Good. That's one for me. Yes. <laughs> so, last question. Yeah. Is this, and there's no pressure to answer this question, is there something we don't know that the viewers don't know that something about yourself that you don't really tell anyone or anything you want to share with us? Mm. I, I, 
I guess the thing that I've found during my life is that because I've never let an obstacle stand in the way, you know, I, and what I mean by obstacle is I've, I've had incredible waves of fear stepping, about to step out in front of 100,000 people at the My Music Bowl yep. to do a concert. Enormous, you know. And and I've found a way around that. It's very personal and it's through meditation, yep. finding the silent part inside me before I step out. Wow. To come into a performance from a place of silence is a beautiful way to, mm. to start. So, you know, I, I guess the only thing I would like people to know is that I'm perhaps a bit more sensitive than I present. I yep. present confidently uh, because I, I've found as a two-year-old the way to overcome mm. those fears, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm, I still have an enormous amount of shyness. Mm. And I had one huge problem and it was really irritating me that I had this problem. So I spoke to Normie about it, Normie Ryan. I said to Normie, Norm, I have a problem. When people pay me a compliment and say how terrific I am, I really don't know how to answer. Mm. You know, I find it really uncomfortable when people say, oh, I love, I love your show. Oh, you know, you're just like, whoa, you know, full on, full on. But th they inside. don't know, but I'm inside. I'm Anxiety. going, oh, blah, blah. so yeah. I said, how, how should I handle that? And uh, Norm said, take them by the hand and say, that's very kind of you. Mm. Thank you very much. Mm. It's That's simple. all you got to say. It's very simple, isn't it? Very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Mm. It's very kind of you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So that's what I do now. But mm. I still have, you wanted to know the secret mm. part of me, really, really shy little boy mm. who learned how to uh, win flies with honey instead mm. of vinegar. You mm. know, I learned that you win more flies yeah. with honey than you do with vinegar. So I've always tried to be as charming as I can be. And well, it's worked for me. Hey, well, I keep fooling him. I think you, you charmed me too. <laughs> no, Thank you. Well, it's really, <laughs> honestly, fantastic just sitting here with you and, and, and hearing your stories. And I, I really you. appreciate you coming in. I'm thank sure you. all our viewers will appreciate watching this and um, just thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, Tom. thank you. That's very sincere and lovely of you. And, and can I say to all those people who are watching this, thank you for your support since I was two years old and mm. uh, and I've always felt it you know that's mm. the one thing that I've always felt mm. is that uh, uh, the audience is like me and mm. um, that's a precious gift to have. Mm. Lucky you stepped out at two and and sang for that chicken I reckon. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much Johnny. Ladies and gentlemen Thank that's you. it for this week. Thank you for watching um, The Profile www.theprofile.com.au Go on, check out all of the interviews out, and particularly this one with Johnny. And um, thanks for being with us. See you next time. Sunny. So true, I love you. Yo
ProCopy, we can transfer audio to CD, make CD, DVD and Blu-ray copies, transfer video to DVD, Blu-ray or HD, digitise slides and photos and supply custom USBs. You can see more details at procopy.com.au or call us on 08 9375 3902 for more information.